Good afternoon to all our viewers out there. Uh, so welcome back to the FIX uh, first annual compliance virtual workshop. Um, in the morning sessions you would have seen we've given presentations on or provided a legal update at least. Also we covered the money laundering and terrorist financing risks relating to uh, beneficial ownership and uh, legal persons. So now and then followed by that we covered some of the reporting statistics and also some case studies. So now the session is equally as important. It's the session that we will uh, take you through um, the reporting and registration requirements for GoAML. Just to note that we have so welcome again. My, I am Yolandi Plakis. I'll be the MC for the session. I'm joined by my colleague Kanisa. Uh, Kanisa is also part of compliance and prevention. So Kanisa will be the presenter for today's for the session at least. Um, what what I ask you to do, everybody online, is just to complete the registration form. So a registra registration link is posted. So please complete that. And yes. Please do enjoy the session. It's very informative and um, over to Kanisa. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us in this session. As Yolani has said, uh, my name is Kangisa Ngozwana. I'm the manager for data systems and reporting. So I will basically be taking through the reporting, so the registration and reporting. So as you are part of this uh, session, you are actually already registered with the FIC. So I'll basically just take you through reporting, tell you what we expect to see when it comes to reporting, tell you what what kind of mistakes are we seeing with your with the reports that are being submitted to the FIC. So let's start with the registration. So section 43B of the FIC Act requires certain entities to be registered with the FIC. As I have said, uh, this session was actually just extended to people who are already registered with the FIC. So I'm just assuming that all of you are registered with us. But we just want to remind you of some of the requirements or some of your obligations when it comes to registration. The first uh, requirement is that once you are registered with the FIC, you have to ensure that your details, your organization details, are actually kept up with the FIC. So that is in terms of Directive 1. So Directive 1 states that all reporting entities must maintain their details on the FIC electronic platform. What that means is that if any of your details change, like the contact person or your phone numbers or physical address, you have to ensure that you update those details with us. And then if maybe your branch closes or your business closes, you also have to notify us so that we can then deactivate that, that account. Directly to also then just states that uh, users are not allowed to share login credentials. What that basically means is that every user who interacts with the GoML system, so GoML is the system that we are using for registration and reporting, they must have their own login credentials. So every entity is only allowed to register one compliance officer with the FIC, but you can register as many money laundering reporting officers as you want. So every single user who interacts with the system must use their own login details. Sharing login credentials is not allowed. And then if any of your details change, like your, your email address or your phone number, you have to actually then update the details on this system. And if any users uh, leave the organization, please notify us so that we can then deactivate those users. 
I will now move over to reporting. When it comes to reporting, please just know that you can only report if you are registered with the FIC. So if you are not registered, you would not be able to report. On the screen now, I am showing you the different types of reports that are expected from you as a reporter. So we have reports in terms of section 29, section 28 and section 28A. So section 29 deals with your suspicious and unusual transaction or activity report. So suspicious and unusual transaction report, that's where there's a transaction that's concluded, but there's something that's suspicious or unusual about that transaction. And then when it comes to a suspicious or unusual activity report, that's where there's no transaction concluded. So a transaction could be aborted or canceled or not concluded. But then there's something that's suspicious or unusual about that activity. So you would file a suspicious or unusual activity report. We also have a terrorist financing activity report. That's then where there's suspicion that there was activity related to terrorist financing. And then we have the terrorist financing transaction report. That's where there's a transaction that's concluded, but then there's a suspicion that it is linked to terrorist financing. So when it comes to section 29, you have 15 days to submit those uh, to the FIC. And just note that when you are submitting these reports, you are not saying that the person is a criminal, but then you're just saying that there's something that's suspicious or unusual about that transaction or activity. And just note that with all the fake reports, you are not allowed to tip off the client. So you can't tell the person that they are reporting them to the fake. And just note as well with your section 29, you can use those as a defense it should you be charged for money laundering because if then it's found that transaction was linked to money laundering and you did not submit a section 29, you might also be charged if you facilitated that transaction. But by filing a section 29 report, you cannot be charged for money laundering. We now move over to section 28 reports. Those deal with the cash threshold report. So the first one is, first report is the cash threshold report. That's where there's a single cash transaction over the threshold. So the threshold is 24,999.99 cents. That means any cash transaction from 25,000 upwards must be reported. So cash, we mean uh, physical notes and coins uh, brought to your prom premises. It also means the traveler's checks, and it also then means cash deposited into your bank account. And then we have the cash threshold report, uh, report aggregation that then deals with a series of cash transactions done by a single client which then exit the threshold. So the threshold then, as you know, is 24,999.99 cents. So for, for Section 28 reports, you have two days to report them to the FIC. And then we have the terrorist property report. So that's in terms of Section 28A. Just note, we have five days to report those. That's where then you find that you you have property that belongs to a terrorist. So how would you know that it belongs to a terrorist? That person would be then part of the UN 1267 list or the targeted financial sanctions list. And just note that, uh, and when we talk about property, we're not just talking about property as in houses or buildings, but we're also talking about property like cars or cash that you might have in your possession. And please do note that for all the other types of reports, you can actually continue with the transaction. So there's nothing that's stopping you, you know, in continuing with the transaction. So you can continue, but with the terrorist property report, you are not allowed to continue with the transaction. So you actually just report to FIC and then you do not proceed with the transaction. 
Okay, so uh, before you submit any report to the FIC, this is the information that you need. So firstly, you need to know the parties that are involved. So who's actually doing the payment and who's actually receiving the funds. So where there's a transaction, there must be two parties to every transaction. So there's the payer and then there's a receiver of funds. When we're talking about the parties, there are three types of parties that you can report. So you can have a natural person or an entity or an account. By an account, we are talking about a bank account. And then for your transactions, one of the parties must be my client. That means that the full details of then that client must be provided. So when it comes to your client, the FIC does not allow you to deal with anonymous clients, which then means at the basic you need, if you're dealing with a natural person, you'd have to know the name, the same name and the ID number. And then for a company, you need to know the name of the company and the registration number, etc. So I was talking about the parties involved, so it's two parties for every transaction, the payer and the payee. You also then need transaction or activity information. So if there was a transaction that's concluded, you need the full details of that transaction. So when did it okay? Where did it okay? And then the amount that was involved. And then if there was an activity, you also need to provide the full details of the activity. So when did it okay, what happened, etc. And then if there are any goods and services, then you need then to provide those. So in terms of then the information that's required for, for reporting, so how would you know what information is required? So that information is actually specific in the regulations. So if you have your FIC Act booklet, there's a part that deals with your regulations. So it tells you in terms of the different types of reports, which or which fields at a minimum that you had. So that is then your client information and transaction information. I made an example just now of when you are dealing with your client, a natural person at the very minimum, you have to have them and the name, the same name and ID. So that is defined in the regulations. And just note that if you don't provide some of this minimum information, your report will fail on going out, but I will touch on that much later. You also then, when you are reporting, you also, so some of the fields are not mandatory in your records. And that information, then if you have that information, you have to provide it to the FIC. So if you need that information to make that transaction commercially viable, you have to provide it. We refer to this information as readily available information. So it's information that you have in your records and then you need to provide it to the FIC. Okay, so uh, this slide is basically summarizing what I have just told you. So remember, I have just said for every transaction, you have the payer and the payee. So the from, that's the payer. So that's the person who's doing the payment and the two, that's the person that's receiving the payment. So I already mentioned that we have three types of, of parties that can be involved in any transaction. You can have a natural person or an entity or a bank account. And just note that for certain industries, if you are the ones receiving the funds, you would have then those details on your side. So um, I also mentioned that uh, 
one of the one type of the of, of the site um, you have to have my client which then means you have to have the full details of then the of 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 then that client and then if you are the one receiving the payment as the entity then that information on the other side you have to provide your full details so let's make an example and let's say a natural person makes a payment to a motor vehicle dealer so they pay Let's say they give them that motor vehicle dealer thirty thousand as a as a deposit to um, as a deposit for for a car. So that transaction would be from my client person to my client entity. Now the my client entity those would be the details of the motor vehicle dealer receiving the payment. Now, if it was the motor vehicle dealer paying the natural person, it would be from my client entity to my client person. Makes a deposit into the motor vehicle bank account. That transaction would be from a person to then an account, which then would be the motor vehicle, um, motor vehicle bank account, which is where then they would have made then the deposit. So that would be from then the account, my client account, to then the entity's account. OK, so just some general feedback when it comes to reporting. So all reports must be submitted on OML. What then that means is that you cannot report your, you cannot submit your report to FIC in any other means except then on GoML. So you cannot send us a letter, you cannot log a PQP with your report. It has to be on GoML on the format defined by the FIC. So when you are submitting then the report, just know that each user must use their own login credentials. So remember, I did mention that you're not allowed to share login credentials so then that means that every user must then use their own user credentials to submit reports and when it comes to that as well uh, like as i mentioned before there is no limit to how many how many users you can actually have so when you are reporting to the fix just ensure that you select the correct report type so when you are reporting there is you can select and then if a report falls under different report types you have to then complete that report under the different report types for an example someone might give you a cash deposit of fifty thousand, and then you might also find that suspicious so you would report two reports one is a cash threshold report and the other report as a suspicious and unusual transaction report. So for uh, when you are reporting, uh, when you are registering with the FIC, you have to, re to register per schedule item that you operate under. You also need for certain industries to report, I mean to register the different branches that you operate. For an example, an entity might have a license as a bank and then is a financial services provider and then is a money remitter. In that example, they would register three times. And then, as I mentioned, some entities, they have to register per branch. For an example, if you are an attorney, 
you have uh, you have a a a branch in Johannesburg, you have a second one in Pretoria, so you have to register then twice under the different so for the Johannesburg branch and and for the Pretoria branch. So when you are reporting, you have to ensure that you actually report under the correct branch and under the correct schedule item. So if you are reporting your, your Pretoria transactions, then make sure you report them under the Pretoria branch. When you are reporting your Janaspec, um, your Janaspec transactions, then you report them under the Janaspec branch. And same with the schedule items. If you happen to fall under different schedule items, just ensure that you report under the correct schedule item. So when you are completing a report, make sure that you complete it as comprehensively as possible. So provide all the information that you might have. And before you submit any report, just take a minute, go through the report. Just make sure that everything is how you planned it to be. You cannot change any report once it has been submitted to the FIC. So do ensure that you take the time to double check the information that you are providing. And then you have to also ensure that you monitor your message board. So the message board is where you get notifications of of uh, the mo mo uh, notification after you submitted the report. So it tells you whether a report has been rejected or it's successful. And then if it's successful, then you have to, there's no further action from your side. But then if it's rejected, you have to actually remediate it. I will um, touch on this uh, much, uh, much later. Okay, so we're just going to give you some general guidelines now when it comes to the different types of reports. So section 28 deals with your cash threshold reports and then your cash threshold reports aggregation. Remember, I did mention that these reports are due to the FIC within two days. So that's where there's a cash transaction that is from 25,000 and up. So because these are cash transactions, you must only report cash transactions. So no EFTs must be reported and no interbank transfers. So as I mentioned before, when we're talking about cash, we're talking about cash that's brought to your premises. We also talking about cash that's deposited into your bank account. So just ensure that uh, you do check your bank account on a daily basis to make sure that there was no cash that was deposited that was over the threshold, because if it was over the threshold, it needs to be reported to the FIC. What we normally find is that people do monitor the cash that's brought to the premises but they do not monitor the cash deposits into the bank account. And remember as well, we just only, so it does reflect on your statement as a cash deposit to no EFTs. And then when it comes to your cash threshold reporting aggregation, remember that's where we're talking about a series of transactions that are done by one client. So you just need to make sure that you do define your aggregation period. So what we usually recommend is that in the morning, you must check the, the transactions done for the previous day. So check your, your cash uh, that was brought to the premises as well as check your bank statements and then report then those so that you can get then your aggregation. So when it comes to then um, reporting then these cash threshold reports and cash threshold reports aggregation, these are the types of errors that we normally see. Firstly, I'm sure you remember that I mentioned that one of the sites must be my client. And in certain instances where 
you are receiving the cash, both sides must then be my client because if a client is paying you as a motor vehicle dealer or as an attorney or as an, a casino, you would have your details on the other side. So you'd be expected to have your full details and then on the payer side, you would have the client's full details. So what we find is that sometimes when people are reporting transactional reports, one of the sides is not my client. So if you don't have one of the sides as my client, you will, that report will actually fail on the fixed side. So you will actually be required to then to then uh, remit, uh, remediate that report and then submit it to the FIC. We also find that when it comes to your cash threshold transaction aggregations, so with those, those are cash transactions for one client. So when you are packaging those reports to the FIC, a CTRA or a cash threshold report aggregation must only contain transactions for one client. And then those transactions as well must be paid direction. So what I mean by direction is that you would be adding the, you would be reporting the different deposits that were done in that one day and then you'd be reporting separately the withdrawals that were done. So you would not report in one report withdrawals and deposits because those are two different different directions. And also when it comes to cash threshold reports aggregations, as I've mentioned as well, those must only be for one client. So you must not report multiple clients in one report as a cash threshold report aggregation. We also find then that when it comes to these reports, they fail because certain information that is required is, is then not, not reported. For an example, if you are reporting a natural person who is your client, you have to provide that person's ID if they are South African or a passport number if they are not South African. And also then for your cash threshold reports and cash threshold reports aggregation, you have for the transaction mode and the fund type, you only use cash received by AIRI if you are receiving then that cash or cash paid by AIRI if then you are paying out the cash. So no other transaction mode or fund type is allowed for CTRs and CTRAs except then those two. Okay, we'll now move over to section 29 reports. So remember those section 29 reports, that's where then we're dealing with your suspicious and unusual transaction or activity reports and your terrorist uh, financing activity or transaction reports. So these reports then are based on suspicion. So you need to, when you are completing then those reports to the FIC, you need to provide us as much information as possible. Because remember when uh, the FIC is looking at that report and analyzing it, they would not have been there when you were forming your suspicion. So they need to understand why you feel that that, that transaction or activity is suspicious or it's unusual. So provide us as much information as possible. So uh, tell us the why, why do you feel uneasy or, unusual, or what did you find unusual about that transaction or activity? How did it occur? When did it occur? Who are the people who were actually involved where did it actually okay so give us as much information as possible and then if the accounts uh, that are involved you can you must also provide us with the balance uh, on those accounts and uh, so these reports you have to provide the reason that's where you capture then all these questions that I was, I was uh, telling you about where you capture your grounds of suspicion. So the field is called reason, so that's where you provide this information. 
So this report and all the other reports, they actually also allow you to attach supporting documents. So you might have you might have some supporting documents. For an example, if someone was trying to open an account and you notice it's a there's a fraudulent ID or a fraudulent bank statement, you can actually attach those to their report. And that those would actually help the fit to actually see that, oh, OK, so this is what they, they provided. So it would help with the investigation. OK, so when it comes to then these reports, so we're talking about your suspicious and unusual activity report and suspicious and unusual transaction reports. The mistakes that we see people doing is that they don't provide their resin field. So the resin field, as I was saying, that's where you then capture the resin for suspicion. So what what are the new grounds of suspicion? So if you do not report that, then that will actually then cause the report to fail. So you have to provide that that uh, report for for your suspicious and unusual activity report as well as your suspicious and unusual transaction report. You also need to provide the action. So the action that is what did you actually do after then you form the suspicion. So you might have had your internal error, your internal process that you that you uh, followed after you submitted the report. So that's what you specify in the action. Or you might also then find that you might also then uh, not have done anything. So all you did is then to report to the PIC. So if that's all you did, then it's also fine. You can then um, provide that. But just know that if you do not provide the reason and the action field, your report will be rejected on the fixed side, and then you will then need to remediate and resubmit to the FIC. When you are submitting as well these reports, just ensure that you complete all the mandatory information. So for an example, if you are reporting your client who's a national person, provide ID or passport. If it's a company, provide their name and registration numbers. So when you are submitting any report to the FIC, just make sure that you do not summarize the transaction. So what do I mean by that is that if uh, a person made a cash payment of 10,000 and then another one of 20,000 and then you're finding that suspicious, the report actually allows you to capture multiple transactions. So you can't just uh, report that as, you know, add the two amounts together and report that as 30,000. You actually have to put those transactions separately. As I've said, that's not only applicable to STRs, but to all the different report types. And just ensure that you do provide all the information that's required. So the full details, the transaction details, as well as then the client details. OK, we'll now move over to Section 28A. That's then where we are dealing with your terrorist uh, property report. Remember for those that this report I told you, you have uh, five days to submit it to the FIC and you are not allowed to continue with the with the transaction. So for this uh, for this type of report, before you actually accept a client, you actually have to do screening, client screening. So how do you actually then do the screening? You have to ensure that that client is not on the UN 1267 list, and they are also not in the targeted financial sanctions list. And those lists then you can find on the FIC website. So before you actually 
then uh, take on any client, you have to actually ensure that they are not on those lists because you are not allowed to to transact with anyone that is on those lists. Secondly, someone might have been might not have been on those lists, but then be added later. So you you have to actually do ongoing screening of your clients just to make sure that they have not been added to the to that list. So you have to do that screening on a on a you know on an ongoing basis. But as I said, uh, those lists they are available in the FIC website, and uh, the targeted financial sanctions list actually does allow you to subscribe to it on the FIC website so that if any changes are made, you actually do get a, an email notification. So uh, in the slides, we're just telling you about the normal just scenarios or the normal errors that we see across the different report types that people do when they are when they are reporting to the FIC. So we know that the scenarios are not reported correctly. So you're not capturing correctly what actually happened. For an example, if you receive then funds in your premises, as I mentioned, that would be then if it's from a natural person and that would be a person to a um, to then the entity. We actually have defined the different report scenarios for you and then we've made uh, we've made uh, the examples pay industry so that is then um, in uh, in guidance note 5b that's where we actually have provided you the different scenarios and we also do have the user guides on our website showing you how to report we also find that information is not provided so required information like your id numbers or full transaction details that information is not provided so then as i mentioned your report will fail if you don't provide that as i've mentioned before when you are reporting different transactions you are not allowed to summarize them so list those transactions separately in that one report the uh, the system does allow you to do that. We also know that people then will use unknown or not obtained for information that they should have. So if it's your client, you are supposed to have the information. So check the regulations, check what is there. And we also find that people are not are not remediating the reports when they fail. So if you submit a report to the FIC and then it is rejected, you actually have to remediate it. So you cannot just leave it there. If it's just left there, then that means you have not completed your, your, your reporting obligation. So when it comes to reporting, just ensure that you do have a documented process in place. I'm sure in the morning sessions they talked about the about your RMCP, so make sure that you do um, you do document your reporting processes. So make sure you outline all the steps. So how will you actually know that there's something to report and how are you going to monitor that what needed to be reported was actually then reported and how are you going to monitor that your processes actually do allow that to happen. And then you also have to ensure that you have processes to remediate uh, the reports. Remember when a report fails, you have to remediate it and there's no additional time that's allowed for remediation. And just make sure that whatever processes you have in place, they allow you to report within the defined timelines for the different report types. So I, I mentioned before for CTRs and CTRAs, you have two days for SARs and STRs have 15 days. So make sure that whatever processes you have in place, they do allow for that. And you know, not being able to report because someone was on leave, that's not an acceptable excuse. So you can have multiple people who do then the reporting for you. 
and just ensure that you do conduct regular reviews of your reporting to make sure that um, you do meet then the prescribed uh, requirements. And then just ensure that your 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 um, the people in your entity are actually trained, so they know that you know they know to notify you if there's something that is then reportable. So for an example, you might have your your salespeople in the car industry, but then those people don't actually do the actual reporting, but they're the ones who deal with the client. So they are the ones who would be able to pick up if there's anything that's suspicious about, you know, that transaction or that client. So they should know to actually notify, you know, the person who's reporting that there was something like that. So make sure you do have those processes in place. And then, OK, so. Um, I will now move over to some of the screens that are on the system just to help you manage your reporting process. So the screen I'm showing you that's on the system on GoML. You can only see this if you are logged in. So one thing we find uh, is that from time to time we receive requests from users telling us that you know, um, there will be an inspection. Can you tell us how many reports we've um, submitted to the FIG and what is the status for that? Please do note that the FIG does not share that information with the users. You are actually able to access that information for yourself from GoML. So if you go on GoML, you have to uh, log in. If you go to the submitted reports menu, that's where then you will see all the reports that you've submitted. Mm -hmm. You will also see the status of those reports. So where the report is saying process, that means it was successful. There's nothing that means to be done from your side. And then where it says it rejected, it is the status is rejected. That means that there is something wrong with the with that report, so you actually need to fix it or remediate it. So you fix it by clicking on the rejected uh, report. Go to revert that report will move to the drafted reports menu and then you'll be able to re to revert it. This menu also allows you to download your report, so download it, but just know that you'll only be able to download it within 30 days of submission. So make sure you work on this menu. You download uh, everything that you need to download because as I mentioned, the FIC will not share your reports uh, with you. So we also then have the message board. So the message board that is, so every time you submit a report to the FIC, you get a notification through the message board. So that that notification will tell you whether then that report was fully, was uh, accepted, so it was fine, everything was fine, and then there's nothing that's required from you. And then if a report is rejected, you actually ha have to remediate it. So if it was rejected, you'll get a message through the message board that will tell you why that report was rejected. So for an example, you might not have included an ID number or a passport number for your client, or you were reporting an STR or an SAR, and then you did not provide a resin field or then in or a an action field, your report will be rejected. It will tell you and then if you get that notification, then you have to go to that menu that I showed you before, submitted reports, go to where that report was rejected, to the re uh, report that's rejected, click on it, go to revert, that report will move to the drafted reports menu and then you'll be able to then um, 
um, fix whatever that was wrong with it and then uh, resubmit it to the week. So then uh, one of the menus is the drafted reports menu. So this menu, if you have a report that was rejected and then you go to the submit uh, submitted reports menu to revert it, it will move then to this menu. This is where you go in and then you can edit the report and then resubmit to the FIC. Remember, if the report is not processed successfully, it actually counts as you did not submit it at all to the FIC. So monitor your message board, make sure that you do submit uh, all the reports that are outstanding and check your submitted reports menu as well. Make sure that there are no reports that are that are rejected. The drafted reports menu also then keeps a draft of reports. If you save a report but you do not submit it, it will also be under the drafted reports menu. So make sure you um, you check this menu on a daily basis. Make sure there's no report that was saved there and you actually meant to to submit it, so make sure you um, access that. Yeah, so uh, make sure that you you monitor this uh, on an ongoing basis. And then finally, on on the FIC website, we actually have a lot of documents that can help you with your registration and reporting. So we have user guides per report type. So those have screenshots showing you step by step how do you actually report. We also have videos uh, on YouTube as well as on the FIC website that show you how to report. We also have different uh, other products that are on the FIC website. As I mentioned, we have met, mapped out the different scenarios for you on Guidance Note 5B. So check that, make sure that you stick to what we prescribed for your industry. And then we also have a uh, guidance note 4A that then deals with the remediation process. So how do you actually deal with um, with instances where you need uh, to remediate reports? And then if uh, you have any issues when it comes to then registration on reporting, Please just formally log them with the FIC on the FIC website, so fic.gov.za, then go to contact us, compliance queries, and then uh, ask your, your, your uh, log your query there. You can also then uh, log, um, you can also contact our contact center. The number is on the screen. That is all from my side. Thank you. Uh, if you do have questions, please feel free to send them uh, through our chat and we will actually just deal with them now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kanisa. That was very informative. So we do have a few minutes for Q&A round and we've received quite a few questions through. So I'll just read out the question for you, Kanisa, and then you can respond, please. So the first question there is, if a retail tenant pays a monthly rental of 25,000, so that's a monthly rental, by a cash deposit into the bank account, would the transaction need to be reported? Yes, so yes, it will need to be reported. It's a cash payment, so if it's cash and not an EFT, it will definitely need to be reported. Yeah, we see that uh, what happens if you realize you haven't been keeping track of bank cash deposits? How should you report all the reports that you have missed previously? OK, so when it comes to reporting in general, uh, we, we just always say, OK, just make sure you stick to the timelines. But if at a certain point you realize that you have missed reporting, it's actually better to report late than not to report at all. So if you find now that you do have reports that you have missed, we do have a process called the directive tree. So you will also find that in the FIC website. So you will have to notify the FIC in writing of then those missed reports. And then we will guide you as to how to then um, 
submit them because you'll also have to quantify for us how many that you have missed and then we will guide you through the process. But you have to notify us in writing. So we'll write a letter and then you can then uh, do that letter, send the letter to the uh, FIC website, so fic.gov.za and com uh, contact us compliance, compliance queries. Thanks for that. So the next question there, if you receive various funds and want to report it as suspicious, but I have no details of the client, how do you report it within 48 hours? OK, so uh, firstly, when it comes to suspicious and unusual transaction or activity report, you actually have 15 days, so you don't have uh, 48 hours. But then for the cash part, so if you are reporting the cash, then you do have 48 hours. So in terms of then receiving cash, you should actually receive cash from your own clients. So we have actually published guidance where we actually say you should not be sharing your banking details with people that you know people that are not your clients. So we actually strongly discourage entities from sharing their banking details on their website. So and um, so just make sure that the processes that you do have in place allow you to actually identify whose cash it is within then the 48 hours. OK, um, the next question there. Is it possible that the GAIML system can pre-populate the entity or account details for the company since it will not change until we can change it on our my org details. Unfortunately, that is not possible right now. It's definitely something that we have been um, that has been requested by uh, different entities because remember as well that uh, the fit deals with different industries. So for certain industries like your casinos or your motor vehicle dealers, your your details will always be on the other side. But then when it comes to your bank, you know, your bank transaction, if you do a deposit on a, let's say from an ATM to an account, the bank details are not on the other side. So it's not the same reporting scenario for every user. And the issue we actually do have with GoML is that uh, that system was um, designed by the the UN, United Nations. So unfortunately, when it comes to then um, enhancements or any changes, it has to go through them. We have requested this from them, but what's also challenging with them is that this system uh, actually caters for the different financial intelligence units across the world. So then they only implement something if it's then going to be applicable for the different, you know, different countries but it's something that we've definitely noted and we have requested from them, but unfortunately for now, um, it is not possible. Yeah, we've got, um, I think I'm gonna set out two more questions, then we'll uh, close this, uh, the, the presentation. Is it possible to increase the size of the message board on GoML? We archive monthly, but still find ourselves close to the maximum of 750 megabytes. Unfortunately, not at this stage. So the challenge that we have with the message board is that, you know, it's for all the different different entities that report to the FIC. So now imagine then that 750 times the number of reporters. So at this stage is not possible. What we actually just advise is that you have to have a process within your, your entity to download then those uh, messages on a, on a frequent basis. Thanks, Kanisa. And then finally, who can assist? GoML does not recognize our login details and does not allow us to log in or reset the password. Noted we were registered and were not able to log in, but no longer permitted. 
Okay, so with that, you can uh, call our call center or you can then log a call uh, to then fit.gov.za, contact us, compliance queries, and then we will check what is going on then with your account. Oh, thank you so much, Kanisa. Um, I think that then brings us to the end of this presentation. Please join us for the final presentation in a few minutes. Uh, again, thank you very much to all the viewers out there. Please make sure that you completed the attendance register. Okay, thank you so much. Cheers.